Uh, Melissa's going to hit record. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Angie Barker Jackson and I'm the Associate Vice President for Development here at Berkeley School of Theology. And we are so delighted that you have joined today's first Friday Lunch and Learn session. If you have not yet introduced yourself in the chat, uh, please do so. And I'll invite everyone, no matter where you are in the world or what time it is for you, please feel free to enjoy a meal or a snack while we're together. That's why we call it Lunch and Learn. This series is sponsored by the Alumni Engagement Office here at BST. Melissa LeBuff, Assistant Director of Alumni and Donor Engagement, is co-hosting with me today. She will be monitoring the chat, and she is your source for information about future events. Thank you, Melissa, for all that you do. It looks like we have a diverse representation of the BST community here in the room. I see administrators, faculty, staff, alumni. Oh, there's trustees in the room, uh, <laughs> students, old friends, and new friends. So what a wonderful thing to see all of you gathered in this space. These Lunch and Learns have been designed with three purposes in mind, learning, connecting, and being. Each month will feature a different topic and a new guest. Our hope is that the topics will stretch and challenge our minds, that we will connect and reconnect with others in the BST network, and that this will be a space of radical belonging. We're planning for great variety and rich conversation. Today, our guest is Dr. Eric Sias, Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies. Dr. Sias completed undergraduate work at the University of Texas at Austin, where he majored in religious studies and minored in Jewish studies. He earned an MA in Hebrew Bible from Yale Divinity School and a PhD from the Graduate Theological Union, where his dissertation topic was the blood of Christ as a ritual detergent, Romans 3, 24 to 26a, through the lens of the purity laws of Leviticus. I can only imagine how this topic makes for great dinner party conversation, Dr. Sias. Prior to coming to BST in 2022, uh, Dr. Sia spent four years teaching undergrad religious studies, and before that, five years in parochial secondary schools teaching theology and religion. He is a bit of a linguist with varying levels of fluency in six languages, a classic underachiever. And when Dr. Sia is not teaching about ritual sacrifice or the Bible and popular culture, he is busy in the outdoors keeping bees and gardening. One last thing for our attendees today, when you are given the opportunity to ask questions or participate, don't hesitate. Dr. C.S. loves great questions and does not shy away from lively discourse or a challenge. Welcome, Dr. C.S. We look forward to a provocative conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It made me blush a little bit not an overachiever at all. Um, I struggle with the languages very much, actually, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me uh, for this, and thank you all for being here. I'm I'm flattered that uh, you know I have so many people who who are interested in the topic. I was kind of worried that I would be off in another galaxy, far, far away, with talking about these things that people would not be not be too interested. But um, as Peruz mentioned earlier, I, I think it is a very timely thing. Um, especially now, given our political climate uh, currently within our country. Um, so first, the purpose of this uh, talk is, you know, just to get ourselves a little bit acquainted with the summer course that I will be giving on conspiracy theories in the Bible. And the reason I really pushed for this course, and another thing that I'm extremely grateful to BST for is that how supportive they were of this, is... Um, the point of this course is that I, I really want to prepare the church leadership, pastors, ministers, you know, anybody who will be within a, a congregation um, on how to respond to these particular ways of thinking or responses 
um, within the congregation, um, the, the people that I've spoken with that have encountered conspiracy theories or people who really have fallen into conspiracy, conspiratorial thinking, uh, we'll call it like that, um, church leadership really hasn't figured out how to respond to that directly or efficiently to sort of sway people into another direction. Um, and um, you'll see I'm, I'm really using my language carefully here because I don't want to be pejorative in my language as well, too. You know, I, as we go on through this conversation today, uh, I, I, I hope we come to the understanding that we actually all fall into this type of thinking, of conspiracy thinking. Um, everybody has at least something they think of that, you know, the moon landings were faked. Uh, JFK was assassinated by someone other than Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Or someone murdered Princess Diana. These are the typical things that people bring up as like the sort of prototype that, yeah, somebody somewhere believes something like that. But, you know, now it's becoming a lot more of a, a political slash religious uh, battle within the congregations. And that for me is really where my concern lies. So the point of this class then is to respond to that. And so today I'm going to be giving a little bit of a, of just a, a summary, uh, scratching the surface of what this the course will be this summer. Now, what got me started, <clears throat> I would like to say a little bit about this. What got me started into conspiracy theories and the Bible and religion actually started way before this whole political mess that we're in today in the country really took effect. It actually started when I was teaching at an HBCU in Jackson, Tennessee, um, called Blaine College. And I was there from around two, 2012 to 2015. This issue, I had students coming up to me many times asking me, what is this thing, the Illuminati? And, um, you know, it, it was such a, an interesting topic. And I, and I was like, you know, that, that's, that's, a really, that's a really good question. So I, I started diving deeper into the topic and into the issue. And I found that there was something quite insidious going on here with this issue of the Illuminati. So are, are we familiar with what the Illuminati is? Is anybody... Has anybody heard of this? And I'd really like engage. So does anybody want to unmute and say a little bit of what the Illuminati is? Anybody, please. Nobody? Are we going to be shy? I hope not. I don't like shy people. I want to get everything out of everybody. <laughs> That's why um, teaching in person was always better because I could just point to somebody. I saw I saw Carolyn raise her hand. Go ahead. I don't Carol. know a lot about it, but I understand it's some kind of cult where okay, people it's a come cult. together and they are uh, on certain type of philosophies or theological, theoretical perspectives and they are together about that purpose. That's about it. Okay. And who 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 belongs to this, this a cabal? A lot of the rich and very wealthy people in Hollywood and all these other people I heard about. Okay. Right. <clears throat> the people I hear the most and not just when I was in Lane College, but just in general and in my research, uh, the typical people are like George Soros, um, Hillary Clinton, Jay-Z, Rihanna. Um, and, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of others. But, you know, those are the names really Bill Gates now is, is, is going into um, um, that, that side. And so it involves, you know, a bunch of of, of just odd things of, of, of blood sacrifice, of pedophilia. You know things the the worst things that you can imagine of a of a of a human perspective or even just ritual um, in general, and so my question then always when I dive into these things um, and particularly within this frame with this this concept of conspiracy conspiracy theories was why 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 are these these like concepts being brought up? And who is the one who is gaining and who is the one who is losing, right? And so as I begin to dive in more and more, I found that this is more of a power dynamic than anything else. 
I remember as a child, and this is probably a lot from where it spawns from, um, my interest is the when my mother would go around saying, don't ever play Dungeons and Dragons. That's the game of the devil, right? And so the the big satanic scare was going on in the 80s, in the 80s and early 90s. And now that I've gotten older, I realize what Dungeons and Dragons is. It has nothing to do with Satanism and it has everything to do with, you know, as you would typically say, a bunch of nerds getting together and playing a game and having fun, right? Just having this imagine, uh, this imagination put into life. So it really had nothing to do with Satan. It's just that when you create this sort of realm where you can other people, it puts those who are othering in a higher position of power than those that don't agree with that position. I know that sounds a little convoluted, but that's what we're going to talk about here today. So when I looked into the Illuminati, let me put it like this. When I looked into the Illuminati, I saw who was the one saying, pointing the finger, and who was the one who was part of this secret cabal. And it was interesting that people who are pointing the finger are just as well elites, are just as well part of these groups that are so-called um, cultists, but they belong to a certain demographic, while those that don't belong to that particular demographic, right, either with race or either having to do with some sort of social class or their upbringing or their past or their political leanings, right? They get pigeonholed, they get shifted to this othering place, and that othering place then becomes the demonic. It becomes a satanic. And that's where then the one who is trying to shift that balance of power can create, can imagine a world, a supernatural world, where then it then applies those that they don't agree with into that particular perspective. So essentially what I'm saying, and we'll get to this in a second, because I, I want to make clear today we are going to be, I'm going to bring bringing up some pretty controversial things, right? Some things that are really going to shake up our traditions and our understandings of what good and evil is, of the origins of good and evil, what God, what Satan is. It's going to shake things up a little bit, right? But essentially what I'm going to come down to, boil down to, so a summary of all this is that Satan or Lucifer is created, is a created figure as a weapon or as a tool of convenience for those who are in power can marginalize those who are gaining power and put them in a position where they then don't have power anymore. So when I see, for example, when I noticed when I was studying the Illuminati, I've noticed that Rihanna and Jay Z were always like, on top of the list. And who was pointing the finger? Usually it was on the elite um, white Christian conservative groups. That already spoke volumes to me in the sense that those who are now gaining power and taking, or not taking, but gaining influence by other people, those who are have had power for so many years begin to worry. Those in power don't like to share power, right? And so then what do they do? They create a new power to make the other's power look evil and their power look good. Now, I hope I made sense up to this point because I know that's a little convoluted and I want to stop here and make sure if there's any questions or if anybody wants something um, clarified or wants to push back a little bit. I, I always welcome this kind of stuff, yes. Carolyn, uh, you're muted. I see you talking. So, uh, so the people that are in power, mm -hmm. those people you're talking about, want to do something to the other people to marginalize them from the rest of the society. Marginalize them from their group that has power themselves. 
Okay, so they want to have groups of people in power from different racial ethnic groups or in general? No, no, no. Those in power, for example, like I mentioned, the Jesus. white Christian conservative um, wings that might have political power, that might have a religious clout within society. How do they keep that power? Is by keeping those people who accept that power, right? But the moment those people begin to give power to others, namely like Jay-Z, like Rihanna, the entertainment industry, this is where the worry, the concern begins to happen. And this is just talking about what I learned when studying the Illuminati at Blaine College, right? This is a power dynamic more so than anything else. This is a, a, a trying to keep power on one side and trying to keep those who have been in the margins for hundreds of years, if not longer, keeping him there, even though they might be, Jay-Z is a powerful individual. He is, his net worth is over a billion dollars. And then with Beyonce involved there, they are a powerful group. How do you take power away from somebody like that? by saying that power comes from Satan. You see what I'm saying? It, it boils down to that. So, hence the conspiracy theories and how they start up. Now, the question here then is, and here's my question to you all, and I would love to hear the different definitions for this, because this is a difficult concept to define. How do we define conspiracy theory? When I say conspiracy theory, how would you define it? What comes to mind for you all? Overpowering someone. Overpowering someone, okay. Mm -hmm. What else? I guess you, you did mention it earlier, it's really a matter of poor play. But if I want to take this to the next level, I guess what you're getting at, what is conspiracy theory? Conspiracy theory, if you want to define it, uh, what I have been able to recollect by you know, working with a few scholars is the sociological aspects of it is what really makes it compelling. So there is a product aspect, obviously, as you said, some Illuminati or all these factions like this out there, but the sociological in conjunction with the power play that would be the genesis in my mind, uh, again, based on my, uh, my research so far, which I'm sure, you know, yours is a lot, lot more than what I have done, is the driving factor for defining the definition for such a type of a construct. Okay. Um, well, the little that I heard, because it was hard to hear you, Peruz, I Yeah. So I see what you're saying there. Carolyn, you have something more? Yeah. Also, you know, it's about the social structure too, because they create different social structures where people coming in don't have the same advantages as other people have. For example, uh, socioeconomic factors like the poor versus the rich. And then you have the systems, them social systems themselves like education, stuff like that, where some people don't have the opportunity to get the same education and wealth as other people. So you have a lot of different social systems that are structured so that those people cannot achieve like other people can achieve. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I see you raising your hand and then Jeff. I'm, I'm wondering if it's uh, people looking at different uh, things within an act, action or an activity okay. and interpreting them differently from other people. Okay. Okay, good. Good. Keep that in mind. Excellent. Jeff? Did you have your hand up, Jeff? Just make sure you put your sound on. There, I think I'm on now. I, you ask what what do I think of when I think of conspiracy, uh, conspiratorial thinking? I think of a lot of us and them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good. That's that's a very important component, definitely. Uh, Sylvia, um, when I think of conspiracy theory, I could be wrong, but I'm gonna just throw it out. You know, like, for example, people have said throughout my life, you know, Elvis is not dead, Tupac's not dead, you know, things like that. Th those are good. some of the conspiracy things. That's what comes to mind. Good, good. 
And I'm glad this is happening too, because now we're starting to stray into defining a term or a concept by examples, right? Because it's such a complicated thing that instead we'll just start to use examples. Now I see Stephanie here on the chat said, a theory that rejects the standard explanation for a cause or event. That's also really important. Uh, sociological power components are the driving factors of defining conspiracy theories. Good, uh, by Peruse. Now, are you all familiar what pareidolia is? So pareidolia is when you look at an outlet for a light, you know, to plug in an outlet or, or to plug in, a, a, you know, whatever electrical appliance into an outlet, what do you see when you look at the outlet? You see a face, right? It's the same thing. You look at the moon and you either see a rabbit or you see the man on the moon. This is what pareidolia means. It, it means that the brain seeks order. Our brain is hardwired from our evolutionary upbringing to, uh, to create order out of chaos. And the thing it wants to create the most, the brain, are faces, because it, it, it has to do with our sociological, uh, our social interactions with other have such a, a big meaning. Yes, seeing a face or seeing objects in a cloud, that's pareidolia as well too. Well, conspiracy theories to a certain extent, I argue, is an example of pareidolia. In this sense, when a certain traumatic event happens, so I'm gonna try and define conspiracy theory here. And this is based off of it partially the book uh, by uh, Brotherton, Rob Brotherton, Suspicious Minds. This is a book we'll be using, one of the books we'll be using in class, is that what Brotherton argues is basically by definition, a conspiracy theory cannot be proven or defined by definition. Now, here's why. Let's take it step by step or how the conspiracy theorists would say, let's connect the dots, right? When an event happens, a big event, something traumatic mainly, what's the first thing people ask? Why? Why did this happen, right? And when the why begins to occur or begins to get answered within a person's brain because they're trying to seek order within this chaos, then the how, then the who's begin to come in as well too. And the how's and the who's tend to relate to the person's particular ideological perspectives, right? So, when something bad happens, that means something didn't go the way that somebody wanted to go. So then they begin to place blame on others. And this is where the othering then occurs. Okay, so that's, that's the first step of the pareidolia, um, is that we create, we imagine why something bad is happening, and then we start to place blame on who caused that. This is where it's taken up a notch then, because what happens then with conspiracy theories, and this is then where I would argue it tends to stray away from critical thinking, because as critical thinkers, we are tasked with, importantly, about questioning why everything, about questioning why we believe why we have come to understand something, why we think this is factual, and trying to find the evidence that goes contrary to that so that we can see another perspective. Conspiratorial thinking goes in that different direction. At its basis, conspiracy simply means what? Two or more people getting together and planning something. When people get together and plan, a surprise party, this is a conspiracy by definition, right? When people get together to rob a bank, this is a conspiracy. Hence, like you can have the legal term uh, conspir uh, conspiracy burglary or, or, or a conspiracy to, to defraud, for example, where people get together so that they can defraud someone else. But conspiracy theory, as Brotherton puts it, is more than the sum of its parts. It becomes an idea. It becomes a system, a way of thinking, and that way of thinking then entails answering the why, the why that goes along with your particular ideological stance, no matter what, that's where it's going to fall into. 
and you need to find the blame. You need to be able to find who that person is, who that group is, that is the cause. Now, where it starts to get really problematic, and this is where conspiracy theories and battling against them or reasoning against them, we'll call it that, becomes very difficult is, again, by definition, they are meant to obfuscate. They are meant to confuse. They are meant to not be able to be proven. Because here is like, the, here's the kicker with conspiracy theories. The moment you don't have evidence, it bolsters the conspiracy theory even more by saying what? That's how good those perpetrators are. They are so good at hiding it that there is no evidence to disprove their conspiracy theory. And that's where we fall into the so-called rabbit hole, in a sense is that's where we fall into the rabbit hole of reasoning, more put, because when you're sitting down with a person and they are inventing whatever they can using facts that are out there that might be convenient to their position, because you're there's always going to be issues. I'm coming across a lot on 9-11, and I'm, I don't know if many of you heard the truther movement, right, of the 9-11 people who believe, or the truther movement who believe that 9-11 was an inside job, that the government was involved so that they could, the government could be able to then begin to spy on the people. Well, you know, interestingly enough, yes, after 9-11, the government did get a lot more power to spy on people. That's already a fact that we know of all these, um, these whistleblowers that have come out. And then, um, so I remember too, when 9-11, you know, uh, mo most of us is not all of us remember where we were in 9-11, but that tower, building seven, remember that that building that wasn't even touched by the, the planes came falling down and someone from the BBC had reported that building seven had fallen before it had fallen. Now, clearly this was a mistake, right? Someone jumped the gun and there was a mistake there. Coincidental, sure but conspiracy theorists love feeding on this information, those little tidbits of information that, that help prove their point because there then they can say what? They're the perpetrators screwed up. They're the perpetrators messed up and they let out a little bit of information, a little bit of the breadcrumbs as they pull it, or as they call it, that we could get from so that we can see the bigger picture. But at the end of the day, when you give evidence to to prove otherwise, to counter that view, all that could be then rejected with is saying that is the government planting that information to throw you all off point, right? The most, the most curious thing for me about conspiracy theories is this. I, I, I just marvel in this all the time, is that how much power they give to the perpetrator. Can you imagine the, the coordination it would have taken the US government to plan 9-11? They can't even pay their bills, right? As we're seeing here of what's going on. And you expect me to believe that the government can get people together and, and coordinate such an enormous event without somebody without a group coming out right and saying it. Here's then where the components that I argue of, of, of the, the supernatural comes into play. Because most conspiracy theorists then, and this is where a lot of Christian conspiracy theorists then bring in the concept of Satan or of Lucifer, where they are then able to take it up a next step and say, they are backed by the power of Satan. And to me, it takes me back to my lane days when I was teaching. Aha, for me, that was my aha moment. This now allows for the conspiracy theorists to say that those who do not belong in their conspiratorial thinking now belong to that other group. And how is that other group then applied then? Through Satan, through the Luciferian worshipers. And... This has actually existed for thousands of years. 
And so here's where we might start to get a little bit more controversial. The first few classes of the conspiracy theory class we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about specifically are the origins of Satan. Now we all know the legend, right? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm I'm purposefully saying this word legend. Uh, Lucifer, he was the most beautiful of angels, right? Sat up in next to God. And one day, what did Lucifer say? I'm better than God. So then what ends up happening? God casts him out with all of his followers and they get sent down to the earth where then Satan is able to rule. And that's why the world then has evil. Is there any place in the Bible that has this story? There is not. This is not biblical whatsoever. It is taken, the legend is created by taking bits and pieces and parts of the biblical narrative and shaped into a story, into a legend for convenience. Because who then falls into those who are swayed by Satan and his followers? The ones who are against the ones writing that legend or that book or that document. This is the usefulness of Satan. Satan becomes the othering tool. And this has been going on again for thousands of years. The first places in recorded literature that we have where we see this concept of fallen angels is in the book of Enoch. In the book of Enoch, we see a mention of two particular traditions. The Azazel tradition, where the angels go and they have um, they teach humans how to make metal objects, weapons, and they teach uh, women how to put on makeup, right? They teach men how to make swords, women how to put on makeup. And then you have the Semyes tradition, where an angel takes other angels and they go and they have sex with women. And they end up creating these offspring, the Nephilim, who are terrible creatures, right? This is the start of the legend, I would argue, at its, at its most um, detailed, I would say. Well, when you read the book of Enoch, what's the context? What's going on? There's certain groups that are being marginalized, and then there's other groups that are not being marginalized. Here's where the concept of apocalyptic literature comes in, and it's a really interesting component to this. So apocalyptic literature in a nutshell is this. It's basically a marginalized group trying to make, trying to understand, make heads or tails of why they are being marginalized when they are part of God's group and those who are in power are part of the enemy's group, right? How is it that God is allowing this? And so what does apocalyptic literature say? We, this is a revelation I'm going to give to you, says the supernatural character to the writer of the text. God has a plan. You are in this part of the plan. This over here is the end. We are at this part where it's rough. It will one day get good. And what God is going to do is put those who are in power down because they're with the devil or they're with the enemy and they will build and God will build you up, bring you up. This to me is what I see is going on within conspiracy theories. Now, the origins of Satan at how we understand it now within the, the Christian context specifically comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And this is argued in the book um, by Elaine Pagels, the other book we'll use in, in the class, titled The Origin of Satan. When the Gospel of Matthew was written, you had two surviving Jewish sects after the, the first revolt, the failed revolt against Rome. You had your Jesus movement and your Pharisaic movement. Now, as we know, I hope, when you have two groups that are similar, that survive a traumatic event, do they tend to unite? No, actually, they tend to go into a state of rivalry. And this is exactly what happened with the Pharisaic movement and the Jesus movement. This is why the Pharisees are given such bad press in the Gospel of Matthew. The Pharisees were not hypocrites. They were not bad. 
This was the perspective of the Pharisees by the ones writing the Gospel of Matthew. So I often compare this. Imagine 2,000 years from now, an archaeologist finding a book, an actual physical book. I know those don't exist anymore. Everything's digital. But imagine a physical book being found by an archaeologist 2,000 years from now of a, a book about Democrats written by a Republican or a book about Republicans written by a Democrat. They would think, wow, these Democrats were some horrible people. Look at this or vice versa, right? This is exactly what we're seeing with the Gospel of Matthew. And what Matthew does is he takes that concept of Satan, which is not in the Hebrew Bible. Satan just means opposition. It's not a, it's not a proper noun. It's not a name. It becomes a name by the Gospel of Matthew. Why? So that those writing the Gospel of Matthew can say what? Those who are against us are with that side. Those who are for us are on this side, right? So it becomes useful. It becomes helpful, especially within a marginalized group or a marginalized society, a society that believes that they are persecuted. So this is where I begin then, and I want to apply the main purpose of why I'm doing this. How then do we address this in the modern day church, right? Because most of the people who are going to be thinking this stuff, most of the people who will be on the side of this either are marginalized or believe they are marginalized. Now, that's the interesting thing about Christianity is that it was formed under marginalization and persecution. So its theology only makes sense if it is in that context to the most part. So many people will create a world in which they think they are marginalized and then create these worlds, these systems, and these otherings, these lines, so that they can justify why they are in that state and why the powerful, from their perspective, has their foot on their neck, right? And so before I move on to my next point here is, I want to see if anybody has anything to, to comment on that, because I know that one is the most more controversial of the points from this. Yeah. Eric? The only yes? comment I'd like yes? to share, the, 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 the relationship between conspiracy theories, but the heresies that were started you know, 2,000 years ago, around the first century and what have you, there is a direct correlation. I guess that's what also you you're getting at, just by looking at the biblical interpretation of some of these constructs. Thank you. Indeed, yes, yes, and there certainly is. So that's why I, um, I, 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 I have Elaine Pagel's book because it, it gets into that as well too. Uh, 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 Dr. Brenneman, you had a, a comment, and then I see Pastor Webster. I'll go after that. And oh, I was just uh, thank you. Um, I was just reflecting a little bit on the idea of um, uh, the idea of whether let's say evil is constructed and personified into a Satan or not. The very fact is, so the question becomes, is it ontological or ontic? Meaning when Paul says uh, he prays against the principalities of, and powers, it doesn't necessarily mean the fact that they were constructed means they're not demonic and that they can't have enormous evil uh, evil outcomes, these belief systems. I mean, it's like, you know, in Isaiah, who does talk about these gods are no gods, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. he's not, there's no sense that these, he's trying to make a case that these are no gods, but on the same, at the same time, these other gods have enormous power um, as, as um, a conspiracy might, or as the Satan in Hebrew Bible is. Uh, so it's just a bit of reflecting on that, the notion that to, you know, to, that the notion, I think that you're hinting at it, that there's a lot of construction going on about the nature of this Satan character as a character, but that shouldn't in some ways, in my opinion, diminish the fact that it's still an extremely powerful idea that, you know, that has affected systems to your point. 
Uh, that, need to, be, that, that need to be cast out, as Paul says. <laughs> Indeed. Principalities and powers. So, so yeah, I guess think of my uh, class here as uh, an exorcism, if you will, right? Not an exorcism of the actual Satan, but of the concept. And, and you raise an interesting point, uh, Dr. Brenneman, and this is why I think it's the most controversial, is because it begins to redefine what evil is, right? Evil then becomes a relative concept, relative to who is pointing the finger of what is evil and what is good. And this is where things begin to get dangerous. And one of the key components of conspiratorial thinking is that the dualistic universe is created within that system and it's obviously going to fit into who um benefit who is pointing the finger and not benefit who the finger is being pointed at right and so then it makes us then think well then what is that objective evil if there is such a thing right and 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 it leads me back to the hebrew bible's oh so careful um, 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 just staying away from just like just pushing away from these these dualistic concepts of that there is this struggle between God and a demonic or or a head of evil that that as Isaiah says God wields the good and God creates the evil right it's 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 all under the control of God and that's really what I see in the book of Job as well too is that God is in charge of everything. And if so, if we were to bring in that system into the conspiracy theory thinking, it would break it apart, right? Because it essentially says God is in charge of everything. Yeah, even those things that you might see as oppressive, God is, you know, God is in charge of all that. And, and that could be a little bit problematic nowadays, too, I, I, I would argue. Uh, I saw Pastor uh, Webster first earlier, and then I'll get you, LaDonna. So I didn't I didn't forget you. I'd say, yeah. Uh, Pastor Webster. So, so thank you, Dr. C.S., whereby I appreciate greatly your, your definition of conspiracy theory. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what your thoughts are about co-intel pro and the FBI. About, can you, can you say that again, the co? Well, given your definition, co-intel pro could be classified um, as, as in the realm of conspiratorial thinking when in fact it was an actual act uh actual program and program that was carried out against uh a specified group and uh was not as cointel pro not limited only to african americans but mm -hmm. part of a two-pronged attack launched from the white house so i'm just curious as to what your thinkings are about that Indeed. And, and so I'm glad you asked this, um, uh, Pastor Webster, because I want to be clear that just because something is conspiratorial doesn't necessarily mean it's false, right? These There are events that conspiracy theorists theorize about that very well could have happened or did happen. When you look at Watergate, for example, that's one thing that I've been reading about um, very much, is that when Watergate happened, the conspiracy theory came up early on that the Republican Party had, had, had caused this, right? And when in reality, they did. They did cause it to happen, that, that they, were, they were the perpetrators of this. So there are instances where, yes, a conspiracy theory might be true or is true. And so what I want to say with that, and that's why I've been very careful with my language to not be pejorative. When I say conspiracy theory, I don't, I don't want it to be a pejorative term. I'm not making it or, or directing it at being a pejorative term because then we begin to other people once again. That's what I'm really trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid the uh, the us versus they mentality. When, when in reality, when someone has this certain type of idea or suspicion, we should approach it just as everything else with um, critical thinking by assessing the evidence for it and against it and coming to a logical conclusion. 
those conspiracy theories that then turn out to be true, like those that have been perpetrated by the federal government on particular um, backgrounds or political leanings, or like those who might have a certain religious um, authority and that they're able to push out others, that has happened in the past. There's no doubt about that. What I'm trying to address here more so is the concept and how then do we how then do we go beyond the concept when the concept becomes so embedded within a person's mind that even logical evidence and conclusions that suggest otherwise are not effective anymore. The one that comes to mind the most is Pizzagate. Are you all familiar with Pizzagate? Right, it's 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 this crazy thing where this small pizza shop in Washington D.C. is the center of all the political elites' pedophilia, and so then a man went in not too long ago during the pandemic, right, with a machine gun, busted it open, ready to kill everybody there, so that he could free the children in the basement. He goes in, and lo and behold, there's no basement. And he can't find where the children are being hidden. And still to this day, he still believes that it is there, right? This is what I am trying to get at, at the heart of this, particularly within our congregational setting. So thank you for that question, Pastor Weber, because that, that certainly did need a clarification right there. Uh, LaDonna? Yeah, I my thinking was along the same lines because so many times we hear conspiracy theories and we say that's not even possible. How could that that doesn't make sense? And we dismiss it out of hand until somebody proves it to be true. Mm -hmm. And yet there are still those conspiracy theories that we are yet asking ourselves, how can anybody believe this? Um, the QAnon stuff, right? The, QAnon. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the Jewish people have lasers that are controlled. You know, all of those things um, that we look at and for some of us reason that nobody in their right mind would believe that. Um, and and yet it it raises one more question that I would like to hear your thoughts about. And I think I've already heard a little bit of it and that is what happens to the theorists in their thinking when they predict that something is going to happen and then the time passes and that thing has not happened, right? Because we don't very often see them then come back and say, oh, I was wrong, right? They come up with a new theory. Um, and so if you could just say something about that. I certainly could, because wow, what a, what a great what a great observation and a great question. Because it happened with the QAnon, right? The storm is coming. The 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 attack on the Capitol happened. Nobody was arrested that they thought, and then they had to redirect. Have you have you uh, heard a Ladonna of the great disappointment that happened in the 19th century um, under um, the Millerites, right? So the 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 Millerites all believed that the that the second coming of Christ was going to happen, right? Because it had been calculated by this guy named Miller, and he was like, I got the date. It's during this date. People went. They gave everything up. They went to this hill. They stood up there. Nothing happened. And then afterwards, Miller was like, oh, I miscalculated. I, I didn't account for the BC AD shift. And so he recalculates. It's actually happening this date. And more people joined in. They gave up all these possessions. They said they were sitting up on this hill in white clothes, sitting there. Nothing happened. After that, it actually turned into a religion, right? This following. And I won't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into like, but we learn, and this is where I find apocalyptic literature really helpful. We learn how to reshape, reshape that supernatural world where it will still fit that concept. These apocalyptic literature was created for hope, in my argument, for hope of a destitute community. What I see conspiracy theories are doing now, they're taking that hope and they're creating power with it now instead. 
So it's not to give hope to a society, it's to give now power to a society. And I know that is a very blurred line, right? And it really is, because when you look in the Gospel of Matthew, there is a, a power shift trying to happen there, but it's it's happening from a group that is completely marginalized. And you can then, though, argue that conspiracy theorists are marginalized, too, because most of us tend to want to say what? Oh, you all are crazy, right? And so that's really where the important component comes in here with this is how then do we respond to this so that we do not marginalize, but bring in, right? Yeah, Jeff, I see your hand there. So, cause I know time is coming close here, Angie. Mm -hmm. Just what, one thing that I've been thinking about as you've been talking is certainly the marginalization has a lot to do with uh, uh, creating that conspiratorial, uh, conspiratorial sort of thinking, but I'm, uh, what I didn't hear mention is, uh, you know, that fear and anger, uh, whether a person is powerful or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do my best conspiratorial thinking when I'm afraid or angry. You know, my my quality of critical thinking goes down in a hurry. And uh, it's amazing where my mind goes. Indeed. And, and you're absolutely right. And that that I, I, I should have I guess I should have specified, but that I categorize with a group who is marginalized. So when a group is marginalized, I automatically then would assume they have that fear and anger, the anger towards the one who is marginalizing them, the fear of being marginalized further or being, you know, destroyed, killed because they are in that vulnerable spot. Absolutely. That's why fear and anger really does perpetuate this more than anything else because it gives that power to that individual but within a supernatural component with versus this world uh, or this uh, realm of this world. So Angie, yeah, um, I think we need to wrap up here. <laughs> oh man, it's hard to break in and put a stop to a conversation like that. And my mind was thinking too about how people prey on that fear and that anger to manipulate, um, which could be a whole nother discussion um, yes, as well. Especially so. within our political politicians yes, have exactly. learned this really well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a great conversation. So um, I, I want to say to everyone who is here that um, it's not too late. You can audit or register for Dr. C.S.'s summer course, uh, Down the Rabbit Hole, Conspiracy Theories and the Bible. Um, there are six Wednesday evening sessions beginning next week, and auditors pay only $120. Um, registration is open until Monday. Um, Melissa will put the link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about the class or, or audit it. it. It looks to be a really um, fun and interesting and provocative um, course. So thank you, Eric, for sharing with us today. Um, so grateful um, for thank, that. Th thank you for um, having me. Yes. We're so glad. Um, in July, the first Friday Lunch and Learn will be on July 7th. And uh, Dr. Leanne Snow Flesher, um, the, the Dean and Vice President of Academics here at BST, will present on the topic 1619 or 1776, a theological response. So that too will be a fun and provocative conversation, I'm sure. I wanna say again, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. BST is grateful for each and everyone who participated um, in discussion, who attended today. I extend a special thanks again and gratitude to Eric for his lively presentation and the energy that he brings to conversations like this. So um, thank you all. We'll keep to our time and, and close now. We look forward to seeing you next month on the first Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>